He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and a, as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of my heart in Christ, I am confident of your obedience, he writes. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. You need to read this on your own and go slowly and capture the kind of influence that Paul has on all these people, the names that were mentioned there. Three things I just want to mention about Paul's discipling or his discipleship method. I see first and foremost from this letter written personally to a personal person the power of influence. Influence. He used influence. He influenced the life of the people he meet. And discipleship is about influence. A new believer. It's about influencing a new believer like Onesimus in this case. Like Philemon in the earlier days, like Timothy in the earlier days, someone who do not know the Lord, walking with them, influencing them, and it is continued. It is about influence not only for the time when they are came to know the Lord and they were baptized, but it is continued. As you read, he was talking to Philemon and he is actually influencing exerting a lot of influence, not pressure, but good influence because of a relationship that has been expressed, that has been developed, and he was influencing even Philemon to take back Onesimus. The power of influence cannot be overstated in discipling. Discipleship or discipling is not a program. It's what I want to tell us today. And ex-Baptist church, I say I will only say the thing that is related to here. I think ex-Baptist church may be here is because we are lacking this influence upon each other's life. And a command that is made that it is I have, and I just heard this this week at a seminar. He says, my friends and my closest friends are outside of the church. And I'm wondering what is happening. Maybe these are the fewer occasions. But we cannot forget about influence. So you see, discipleship is not a program that runs for three months, teaching you how to pray, how to read the Bible, that you should get into fellowship, that you should come to church and all of that. Discipleship is not done in a classroom. But most of us are doing that. We think discipleship happens in cell group. We think discipleship happens during worship. We think it happens during a classroom, a discipleship class. When someone comes to know the Lord, we say, you've got to go to discipleship class. And after three months, we leave that person. Three or four months, we leave that person. And we assume the person is a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Discipleship is influence and therefore it is a journey 
of a lifetime. It's a journey, I use this word, taken between a new believer and a more mature believer and one that often takes place in the daily walk of life. Not in church. Not in the classroom. When I'm eating with you, when I'm walking with you, when we are together playing games, when you are sharing your thoughts with me, when you are facing difficulties, that's where discipleship takes place. It's about influence, about a more mature person who has learned to handle, not conquered everything, has just been a head telling another one, influencing, and said, you know what? I think we should not do this. You know what? Why, why do you pray before you eat? Huh? Why do we give thanks? Huh? You don't want to teach a new believer and say, you must give thanks you know, now, you know, you're a Christian. you got to pray before you eat your food, you know? And she or he will be thinking, if I don't pray, that means I sin, or my stomach will, will hurt after that and all that. You must give the reason, you must disciple and say, why the thoughts is all about that. It is not a program, it is not something in thought in class, it is a lifestyle and a journey. It's a process, if I could use the word, of application of the word. The word must be taught. Certainly. I'm not saying the Bible is not important and all that, but it's a process of application in our daily life. How do you handle a boss that is nasty? How do you handle crude talks among your colleagues? How do you handle a situation whereby you are forced to drink and you do not want? That's discipleship. And the influence very often comes because of my lifestyle influencing the other person's lifestyle. And also the younger person's lifestyle influencing me. Sometimes when we understand why a younger Christian has difficulties, we are in a better position to help them. I am being discipled to be a better disciple. And therefore, the gathering together is very important. The journey of Onesimus illustrates this fact, the power of influence, the importance of influence, and saying that discipleship is influence. It, you look at it, uh, uh, Onesimus' uh, journey. He started as an unbeliever, a betrayer, a thief, a runaway slave. And then... He met Paul. He didn't go and look for Paul. But somehow, by God's intervention, they meet and Paul shared the gospel although he was in prison. I wonder how many of us would share when we are in Paul's state, you know. I'm in prison because I shared the gospel. Now you come another one, you're a slave and everything. Don't give me more trouble, uh. Give me somebody who's more willing to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about receiving someone who is not worthy yet, but believing that God can change the person. And that's the power. Not your power. That's the divine power. You see, our job is to share the gospel, but the salvation is by God, not by us. And Onesimus' journey is such that the gospel was shared by Paul with him and then he was taught the word. Taught of the word. I think many things were taught. It's a journey. It's a process. I didn't, I don't think it was immediately. Maybe he was told, repent and be baptized. Yes. But then as he go along the way, maybe Onesimus at first didn't tell that he ran away from Philemon. Most likely, he didn't tell Paul. You don't pour out everything. And in discipleship, people don't pour out everything to us, all their sins and everything. But as the journey, as they go along, and he saw the joy of Paul, he saw the, the, the comfort that Paul can have even in prison, then he just said, you know what, I've been struggling about this. I ran away from my master. And I stole money. What do I do now? Somewhere along that journey, he blurted out his real situation. And then Paul says, you know what? 
You have read the Bible, we have read it together, I have taught you. You not only have to repent, now you have to go back and be restored. And I'm going to send you back. Onesimus must have his struggle, but he was on a journey of being discipled. And Paul discipled him and said, you go back. You know what? I'm going to write a letter for you. I'm going to write Philemon. And I know Philemon very well, the power of influence. He has discipled Philemon about forgiveness, about restoration. So he, he says, you go back. And I'm going to write a letter. And I know you, you... You see, discipleship is about influence and influence in every area of the life. It's not just about spiritual. And he says, I know you, you are afraid of danger and the thing that can be happened to you, but I'm going to send this disciple that I know also to go with you. So your life is protected. Your physical welfare is taken care of. Influence. As you read and as I read that, traces of influence, and use the word trace may not be the best, but it is not a book on discipleship, but you can see the traces, the power of influence of Paul's life. Onesimus in obedience. And obedience is one of the key things. And it doesn't come overnight. When you disciple someone, they will be disobedient, they will struggle, and they will not straight away obey everything the Bible says. But eventually, Onesimus in obedience returned in obedience to God's word, not Paul. Return to Philemon. A life transformed, resulting in obedience, returning to danger. But that's not the end of it all. That's, that's Onesimus' journey. That's Onesimus' beginning and probably still a new believer. Let's just look at Philemon. Here is someone, Philemon, who is years ahead of Onesimus. And we think that this guy has finished his discipling already. There is nothing to disciple in him, and yet there is still discipling. And in a nuanced form, you can tell that Paul was discipling Philemon even at this stage, although he's years ahead. He urged Philemon, would you take back Onesimus? You know, you know so much about forgiveness. You know so much about restoration. You have read about it. You probably have talked about it. You have probably have discussed about it, how difficult and it is. But here is a real case right now. On Philemon, would you take back Onesimus? Your slave. See, that's influence. He has influenced Philemon to the point whereby Philemon must reconsider and at this stage also being, dis being discipled. And the way he writes the letter is so interesting. It tells us very clearly discipling or discipleship is not by authority. It's not because I'm pastor, I say so. I am the mentor, I'm the disciple, I say so. It is by influence. That is why he, he, he writes this. It is not by status. It's not because you are a CC member, you are qualified to be a disciple. If you are, you are a pastor, you are qualified. It has nothing to do. It has everything to do about our character, the way we live our life, and influencing the new believer. Motivating them and say, how come you can follow God so closely? How can you, you are so obedient? What is the secret? And we tell them, hey, I didn't achieve this in a day. You know? There were certain people who guide me along. There were certain people who taught me. There were times when I sinned. That's influence. Look at verse 8, how he wrote. Therefore, although in Christ, I could be bold and order you to do so what you ought to do. He could use his authority, yet I appeal to you, verse 9, on the basis of love. I call that influenced. He said, Paul, an old man now, and in verse 14 he says, But I did not want to do anything without your consent, 
so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. That is important. Spontaneous. An outflow of a life that is discipled, that is influenced by Paul. It just flow out. That's discipleship. So influenced that the life is transformed and you don't have to use pressure, you don't have to use authority, you don't have to do anything. A life so focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 17, So if you consider me a partner, and Paul, as he writes this, he's not thinking, maybe not lah. And he's not trying to put pressure. I know we read it as almost like pressure, but he is not putting that. He says, I know you will consider me a partnership in discipling. He says, now welcome him as you welcome me. And he says, I'm writing, in verse 19, I'm writing this with my own hand and I will pay back for you. You know something about influence? One of your greatest influences is that I will stand by you. He owes you that, right? So much, right? Don't worry. If he's not going to pay back, I myself will pay back for him. That's how influential Paul's life was on Onesimus and on Philemon. My point is this. Okay? Discipling or discipleship is a process, not a program, not an event. It's a lifelong process of influence and therefore it takes time to be with the person it means extended time it means spending time not just in a class finish three months and then i do not know about anything anything else that's happening it is walking together me walking ahead. i may be one step ahead i walk with you and someone else is walking with me at the same time growing i'm growing at the same time it's not i have made it you have yet to meet it. And I think most important you need to remember is influencing the person to live a godly life. Influencing the person to become christ light. Nothing else. So Paul give us glimpses of his discipleship method here. Before I leave this first point, I want you to reflect on this important statement here. You cannot give away what you do not have. You can only disciple where you have been. Think about that. It needs no explanation. Because some of us, we think we are a discipler. And we think we have made it there. But we don't have that. So what is this, what you don't have? It's actually the question. What is it that I need to be discipled in, that I have yet to have, before I can share about it? You cannot give away what you don't have or do not have, you can only disciple where you have been. The need, I'm trying to point out, the need to be disciple, to be a discipler, and the discipler also need to be discipled. It's never in isolation. It's never, I have made it. I've told you many times, I've got two groups of people Mentoring. One group is my peer mentoring. The other group is someone above me coming down. And they tell me and they share with me. They challenge my thoughts. They challenge my plans. They challenge my decision. Everything. And their influence on me is great. Because I see them ahead of me. And I respect them. They don't have to use their authority. They don't have to use pressure on me. They say, have you thought about this? It's good enough. Because I've seen in their life. And I know they have a wider perspective than I have. 
The second thing that I see in the letter of Philemon regarding Paul's discipling style or method is intention. His intention. The intention, as you can read and you follow slowly, carefully, is never, discipling is never for organization purpose. That's discipling or that's mentoring in the marketplace. You do discipling, you do mentoring to have someone take over your place or have someone do something in the organization. But biblical discipling or biblical mentoring, allow me to use it because to me mentoring is just discipling together, walking together side by side. It's never for organization purpose at all. It's never to help, and this is where churches get it wrong, to help benefit the church. That's never the intention. It's never the intention to give relief to workers or to help in the burden of the church. I know you are thinking about equipping, but let's talk about discipling first. When I come to my third point, or the second part of my this second point, you will understand. The intention of it is never that. You do not disciple someone for organization use. You do not disciple someone, all right, so that he can fit or do a job. While it is important, while it is part of it, but never, never the intention and should not be there. Discipling is never, okay, listen carefully, to evangelize and increase the church numbers so that the church will have more people. And that's why some big churches, and you see, you know, the members, the Christian, the people attending the church are half big or unbig. You know that. And the same can happen in a small church like ours. Because we have the wrong intention. We think discipling is about getting people to do some work and everything. Discipling, the intention of discipling as you read the book of Philemon is transform life. A life transformed to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. If I can disciple and as Paul disciple for people to love Jesus Christ more, automatically out of that, there will be the serving. You don't have to worry about that part. Our main intention, our main cause is, do you love Jesus at the end of your life more than at the beginning? To love Christ more. And the transform life because of loving Christ will result in us wanting willingly, zealously following Jesus Christ in His work. Now, I say following Christ in His work because I've shared with you last month about the servant in the world and the servant from a biblical term is different. The servant in the world is run out, do the job and please the master. What he thinks will please the master, do that. That's our view of servant. And that's world servant. The biblical servant is to stay by the master, look at the master, have that intimate relationship that even in the wink of an eye, he knows or she knows what the master wants and follow and do that. And the moment finished, run back to it. What am I trying to say? Intimate relationship. We need to disciple with the intention of falling in love with God so much, falling in love intimately with Him, that our relationship is intimate with Him, the rest will fall in place. True and lasting service 
will result if there is a real intimate relationship with the Father. We know marriages last because there is real love. Even though it's difficult, even though it's tough times and everything, marriages will last because the two persons are still in love. If there is no love, they straight away think of divorce when things don't get well. And so churches also. People get burnt out. They get disappointed because they are doing by themselves. They have been discipled to fit the church. They've been discipled to fit the organization. Now, most of us assume, you know, this, this, this is the thing that is very sad. Most of us assume that discipling is completed when we see a believer who received the Lord Jesus Christ learn the basics of everything. And as he learns the basics, and he starts to serve, attend church faithfully, and everything, and we say that's the end of discipleship. And we end there. And we have what we call easygoing Christian. The pastor is happy, the leadership is happy, you are happy, I'm happy, just to see you sitting on the pew every Sunday. Oh, good disciple. Faithful, giving the type, attending church activities, giving support and everything. And we think that's where discipleship is finished. And more so, discipleship has been successful if you are serving in a ministry. And that's where we are wrong. Because we go back again. The intention is wrong. The intention is that you must fall in love with God more at the end than at the beginning. Let me just quote you this verse here and then I'll, I'll, I'll just start. You see, because that is a truncated to think that someone is serving faithfully in church, everything and all that, we think that, that is, the discipleship is finished. It's a truncated view. And I will show it to you in the shower. But let's look, let me read to you Mark 12, 29 to 31. Jesus was asked this question and he answered. He said the most important one answer Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. The Lord is what? Love the Lord your God. Not partly, not when it's okay. Not With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than this. We quote this, we say this, but do we disciple people for this? Do we disciple them to love God? Or we disciple them to do work? Or we think discipleship is finished when they are able to do work? And they can be serving for 20 years faithfully. We see them there and everything. But their love for God has not grown. We measure their love for God by their faithfulness and attendance. We measure their love for God by their contribution. We missed it all. You see, Philemon give us glimpses of what Paul discipleship intention is. Verse 5. There are a few verses here, but just look at verse 5, verse 7, verse 21. Verse 5, we say, Because I hear of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. It's about love. The faith is not about attendance. It's about so much in love with God that my faith is immovable. I know my God loves me and I love my God. Nothing, nothing is going to distract me from that. And then in verse 7, you say, Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Again, love. An overflowing love for God that results in an overflowing love for each other in the community. We need to disciple each other for that. And Philemon need to be discipled even on the advantage. Love this enemy of yours now as more than a brother. 
He is useless to you, but now he is useful to you. Hey, it's not easy for Philemon, you know. If you are in his position, and this guy ran away, he stole my thing, now all I have is a letter from Paul and comes back and everything, and you tell me he's useful for me, I even haven't seen anything, you know. You tell me to forgive him, and then to not just forgive him and take him back as a slave, but to treat him as a brother in a different way altogether. That's the love of God for you and for me. That's where you read about the prodigal son. The father loves the son. And we need to disciple people to love the Lord unconditionally. Verse 21, it says, Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. You know, these few verses here are just expression of a disciple of a person who has been discipled to love the Lord so much that it overflows this, that it becomes an encouragement. The obedience is, he will do more than what is required. Not by compulsion or by anything, but out of a love for Christ. Now I'm going to show you something to bring the reality to say that most of us have a truncated view about discipleship. The spiritual formation, the flow of spiritual formation is generally this way. Some of us may have never heard about 5, 6 and 7 at all. We start off with a new life, that means someone saved. And you know, and you and I have gone through this stage, most of us have, And we have struggles about divided loyalty. Should I do this or not? I want to do this, but I cannot do this. And we have that struggle. Do I obey my parents or not? Or do I obey what God says and things like that? You will have that struggle and there is nothing wrong. That is your start of your journey. It's a process, it's a journey. Then you come to the second one. You start learning the basic principle of reading the Bible. You start learning to pray a little bit more. You start learning to love. You start learning a little bit more from the Word of God. And and your life kind of gets in order. You no longer struggle about praying. You no longer struggle about attending church. You no longer struggle about fellowship, giving the tithes and everything. The divided loyalties is something that you have gone way beyond that already and the basic discipline. And then you improve, you go further, and we all do that. You come to the third stage, your life is in order now. Great! It is so in order, you love your family and everything, and you even serve in church, you become deacon, you become pastor. And I'm saying here, listen, pastors get stuck in three. Because the doing is all so fine and everything. But how many of us move on to be touched by His love and presence? Where you value the presence of God. Where the, like the Hebrews say, if you do not go with us, we will not go. Even we will win over the enemy and we will get all we want. How many of us could reach there? Did you know that that is part of the spiritual journey? That is part of our spiritual formation. That is why the Bible says, to what's Christ's likeness, even death unto the cross. We just took the Lord's Supper, you think about that. Awareness of His holiness, focus on being and doing. That means you find that God is holy and you realize how sinful I am. No doubt I do all this good work and everything. I still have those thoughts. Not a major thoughts anymore. I know you have gone through that. Not that you are not reading your Bible, but I still struggle about forgiving. I still struggle about grudges. I still have wounding in my heart that I cannot let go. I want to hang on to the wounds and everything. And you still have that. And then you realize, wow, compared to God who is holy, I am really, really unworthy, a worm in his sight. We talk about it, but do we experience it? Do we, are we aware of that in our heart? And then you come to six, totally devoted to Him. You are passionately in love. 
I use the word love because I think most of us know what is it is to fall in love. You not only like the person, you not only do things for the person, now you are passionately in love. I'll do anything for you. I told Molly once when I was dating her, I said, if you drop down and die, the next moment I will also die. And then number seven, only God matters. I don't care. People doesn't matter to me. I don't mean in a negative sense. My possession doesn't matter to me anymore. The pain I suffer for God doesn't matter to me anymore. The thing I lose for God doesn't matter to me anymore. Only God matters. And I will obey Him without reservation. Because we are married. We are in unity. We are in one. So I ask you a question. Where does X and where will most churches discipleship end? Where do we consider that's the end? And has anyone brought us to tell us that this is the spiritual formation of every Christian that God wants? I tell you what, the next slide. Most of it and when our life is in order and we are serving faithfully. And we say, you disciple somebody else already. You're a good disciple. You are qualified to disciple somebody else. And we truncate the whole thing because I can do that and my life is still not passionately in love with Christ. I have not come to that. And I haven't today. I have a longing. I know I have a journey. It's a journey. I have not. I have at the most touched the tip of the iceberg of being touched by His love and presence. At the very, very most. Paul's lifestyle tells us he understands that discipleship doesn't end at number 3. That is why in Philippians 3, 7 to 11, it reads this way. Those who are, you are Chinese, you have to turn to your Bible. I didn't have enough space to squeeze it in. But whatever was to my profit, I consider it lost for the sake of Christ. Whatever to my profit... What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain. I have never come to this stage, you know. I have never considered my money rubbish. I have never considered my house rubbish. I have never considered my relationship rubbish. I have never considered my successors and my things as rubbish. At the most, I say, not as important. Uh. Okay, shouldn't treat them as important. But to treat them as rubbish, no. And I'm on a journey, and I need journey. I need people to guide me, to bring me there. I consider rubbish that I may not gain Christ and be found in Him, having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which is true faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want, he writes Paul, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing his suffering. That means suffer also, never mind. Die for him also, never mind. Becoming like him in his death. And somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Maybe the closest person who has come closest to that is Mother Teresa. It doesn't matter whether she's Catholic or she's Baptist or she's Methodist. But her life oozes with a love for Christ. That she has fallen so much in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Her life just oozes that out.
the intention is never for works. The intention is not to stop at three. The intention is to be more in love with the Lord, discipling someone to be more Christ-like. Now let's look at the last thing that I see. And we cannot run away from that. The instruction. The influence, the intention, and now the instruction. What every believer is commanded to do. Matthew 28, 19, you know that. Therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. That's not easy. I mean, which disciple have I discipled that will obey everything that the Lord has commanded? It's not about my failure. It's not about their failure. It is about the realization is our discipling is not finished. We are still on the journey. We are still in the process of allowing God to transform us, to reveal to us, to show us. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I will be with you always to the end of the age. The key word always is discipling. Verse 4, Paul's right this way in Philemon of verse 4. He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear first of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints. See, love for God, love for saints. Which are the great, greatest two commandments? Love the Lord with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul. And then love the neighbor as yourself and your love for all the saints and verse 6 I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith surely we have to share our faith surely we have to do that but we do not stop at witnessing we do not stop at evangelizing we must put these two together we must be active in sharing the gospel as Paul was even in prison even in the worst time even now as ex-Baptist Church is and you think it will not grow, we still must be actively sharing our faith. But more importantly is also we need to disciple them. People who love the Lord, disciple to love the Lord, will love the church. No matter how you know, weak the church is. Because it's an outpouring of that. We must disciple them to love God and then to love others. Simple word I've been repeating, repeating is we disciple for life transformation. And life transformation is only possible for one who is totally in love with the Lord. How do I know a life is transformed? I see two things. How do I know? Evidence of transformation. Will obey the word of God regardless of consequences. Paul writes that very clearly. No need to explain that anymore. God alone matters. Obeys God without reservations. No reservation and everything at all. You see this in Philemon. Because Onesimus obeys God without reservation. It was a risk. He's risking his life to go back to Philemon. Don't talk about whether Philemon will accept him or not. Talk about you will die for your mistake. But he walked back. So you see Paul's discipleship? So in love with God, so loud to God, that even if I die, suffer even to the point of death as he wrote in Mark it doesn't matter I count it all lost to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ and for Philemon it was also another journey someone way ahead still has to obey the word of God it's so easy to discuss about forgiveness and everything to take back someone who has wounded you so badly 
hurt you so badly, betrayed you so badly, has no evidence of anything else except for the letter of Paul, coming back, okay, take him as a slave, okay lah, give him a second chance, but to treat him as a brother and one who is useful. Wow. How much does it take? I think it takes everything. One who's in love with God. One who, like Christ, will go to the cross and die for the world. One who understands when Christ died on the world, for the world, on the cross, expects you and I to be dead, obedient even unto death. These are the glimpses or traces of Paul's discipleship method. And I feel they are relevant to ex Baptist Church today. I feel they are relevant because we need to get start afresh. I feel it is God's appointed time and His reason for us to get everything start it. Let's not get excited about putting things in order. Let's get ask ourselves not what to do next. And I'm going to close. But would you close your eyes right now? And allow just the Holy Spirit to speak to you. The conclusion of this is not what action should we take or what plan should we come up with. With your eyes closed, I ask you to pray. I think the first step is to pray and ask yourself, or would you take steps to discover where are you on this journey of discipleship? We need to know where we are before we can move on. Where are you? We are all at different parts. It doesn't matter. We have to start with one. It's a process. We sometimes jump to three, but sometimes we come back to two. Where are you? Would you honestly evaluate and ask, where are you on this spiritual journey? You're not sure? Pray about that. Because it's important. It's not what do you do. Where are you? Where are you? It's not for me to gauge. It's not for leadership. It's not for anybody. Between you and just the Lord Jesus. Where are you on your journey? And I know for sure, Every one of us, every one of us, because it's put there by God, has a longing in our heart to move on. All of us, you yearn for that. You may have been yearning for a long, long time, but you're just too busy, or you just didn't know, and maybe you should start praying, Lord, that longing in my heart to be useful should be a longing to know you better. What is that longing in your heart? My longing in my heart is to feel the warm embrace of my Heavenly Father. I have seen Him as my healer. I have seen Him as my provider. But I have yet to experience Him as a father who will envelop me, embrace me with his arm. I long for that. 
I don't know how that will come, but if God has put that longing there, at the appropriate time you come. So would you pray to discover where are you in the journey and what is that real longing in your heart? Every single one of you here, I know with full confidence that there is a longing in your heart. Pay attention to it. Submit that and tell God, Lord, I have this longing. Pray now next also for a revelation. What are the blockages that hinders you from progressing? What are the blockages? And I think most important of all, as I speak about discipleship, pray that the Lord will point you or lead someone to walk with you on your spiritual journey. If the Lord has given you that longing and you know where you are in the spiritual journey, He will bring someone, maybe a Paul, maybe someone even like a Timothy, or a fireman, maybe someone just sitting beside you, just a few steps to walk with you, so that in that process of walking together, you influence each other life with the intention of knowing and loving God more deeply. To keep tap that my relationship with the Lord is genuine, is real, is continuous, and it is an intimate. God has someone for you. Definitely. Definitely. If he has someone for Onesimus, by his divine appointment, he will have someone for you. Would you open your heart up for that? We can talk about others, other things later, but right now, this is prayer time. Prayer time to recognize where you are, to recognize a longing in your heart. A prayer time for God to point someone to you, reveal someone to you. Father, thank you for loving us so much. Forgive us when we responded by service, when we responded, Lord, by church size and increase in church number to your love, when all you wanted is us to respond to you in love, to be deeply in love with you, to long for you above all things, Lord. I don't know the answer, but this is my prayer. This is our prayer. And because it's a process, Lord, teach us to be patient and not to be distracted and not to be truncated at all. Teach us to pay attention to our inner being. It is in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Would you just stand with me? I think these words are very meaningful. It doesn't matter how you sing it or whatever you sing it, whether you want to sing it or not, it doesn't matter.